name's Rehan Khan, and uh, thank you so much for coming to this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about the secrets of the Arabs. It's a kind of very mysterious title, and here to demystify that a little bit for us is Dr. Eugene Rogan, who uh, let me introduce you to him. So Dr. Rogan is the director of the Middle East Center at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He's um, been teaching Arab history at Oxford since 1991, and he's the author of The Arabs, which is here, and you can see that there as well, which in 2009 was um, uh, mentioned by The Economist as one of the best books of 2009. His follow-up book was The Fall of the Ottomans. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about insights, really, from both the books, from a little bit, from the, well, more from The Arabs, but also from The Fall of the Ottomans as well. Now, I think one of the things that... Um, well, actually, let's give Dr. Rogan a big round of applause first. Sorry. <laughs> Thank that, you. So I think one of the things that you talk about is you say in the early modern period, um, there are kind of four stages or four periods within that of early Arab uh, modern history from the 16th century. Can you just describe what those four stages are? Well, first off, when you write a big history of the Arab world, you know your subject is so vast that you have to try and break it down into some sort of reasonable pattern to be able to paint that tableau. And I was trying to think of how to organize a history of the modern Arab world and came up with this scheme of conceiving of history by who the rule makers are at any given time. Who is the power center that has the power to establish the rules that others live by? And it seemed to me for modern Arab history, there were four clear periods where you can identify who was making the rules. And the modern period for me, breaking with medieval Arab Islamic history, comes with the Ottoman conquest in 1516, 1517, where for the very first time in Arab history, the Arabs would be ruled not by one of the great cities of the Arab world, Umayyad Damascus, Abbas at Baghdad, Fatimid Cairo, but would be ruled by a Turkish city, former Byzantine city, Istanbul, though they were not born to Turkish language because the Mamluks who had ruled a lot of the Arab world until the 16th century spoke Turkish themselves, Sunni Muslims, there was a lot of continuity there. This was nonetheless a major rupture. And my argument is, from the 16th right to the 19th century, the rules were made in Istanbul, and for the Arabs to navigate those rules, they had to learn Turkish, and they had to petition a government in a foreign city. The next major period in modern history is going to be when the center of rules shifts away from Istanbul towards the centers of the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, and that means Paris and London. And in the 19th and into the 20th century, the real center of gravity for the world order was Europe, and this is the colonial period for the Arab world. And that will last right up into the Second World War, when new powers will take the ascendance. Moscow, Washington, now we're in the Cold War. And the Cold War, if you like, makes for a third period of modern history, which is going to last right up until the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait in 1990, when for the first time the USSR will go along with a UN resolution allowing America to lead a coalition against one of the Soviet Union's long-standing allies in the region, Iraq. At that point, even Syria joined the American-led coalition, recognizing there was a new age where it was going to be unipolar American power and the power of the global economy. So, in this sense, the rules of the global economy in Washington were to dominate the period from 1990 till now. It's never looked so bad as it does in the period of unipolar American domination. Okay, so those are the kind of the four stages. Let's kind of drill down a little bit into a few of those. Deep history. Yeah, let's go into some deep history. So I think um, if you look at what you were saying was that what the Ottomans really took over from around the 16th century, um, and until about the 18th century, you say generally there wasn't that much pushback from the Arab world in terms of ruling from Istanbul. Mm -hmm. But around the 18th century, the relationship between the Ottomans and the Arabs reached a crossroads. Mm -hmm. 
what happened? In some ways, the Ottoman Empire was a victim of its own success. It had gotten so big. It had kind of reached, reached the limits of what it could conquer when, in the late 1600s, it failed to conquer Vienna. And then they found themselves in the territory which became increasingly difficult to administer by their old bureaucracy. And this left room for local leaders to emerge in the more distant provinces. And basically, if you're looking at the world from Istanbul, Baghdad, Aleppo, Damascus, Cairo are distant provinces. And you had local leaders emerging in these territories able to accumulate control over a lot of land. That meant that they were collecting taxes for their own benefit rather than for the Ottoman government in Istanbul. They start building militias. These militias become armies. They start building palaces. Artisans do beautiful works for the cities of Baghdad and Damascus and Aleppo. All of that strength and wealth and power is going to local leaders rather than to Istanbul. Mm. And at that point, Istanbul totally preoccupied with wars against more powerful neighbors like Austria-Hungary, like Russia, and struggling in wars against these European neighbors, they don't have the resources to go and impose their order, their will, on these Arab local leaders. And so you'll have in the emergence of what we would now call Palestine in northern Galilee, Dahir al Omar, followed by a Mamluk from Cairo named Ahmed Pasha al Jazar who will make Acre in Palestine into a real center of a mini empire in its own right. Or even in 18th century Egypt, Ali Bel Kabir, who will emerge as someone who can unify the Mamluk households of Egypt under one man's rule, with all the wealth that that implied, to actually take on the Ottoman state. He'll lead an army, the first from within the Ottoman Empire, to conquer Ottoman territories. He takes Damascus. So the Ottomans were clearly losing power over their own sovereign land. Local leaders were collecting wealth and power in their own hands locally. The challenge within the Arab provinces against the Ottoman center was on, and the Ottomans did not have the solution to that problem. That's the crossroads. Okay, so let's take, uh, uh, I mean, you mentioned three local leaders there. Let's just take one of them, which is Muhammad Ali in Egypt, hmm. okay? Now, he was initially a tool of the Ottomans to suppress, particularly in Arabia, some insurrection. Uh, but what went wrong in terms of how did he get so powerful that he almost became a threat to the Ottoman Empire? Well, first off, Rihan, what do we call this man? We know him from the Arabic tradition as Muhammad Ali Basha. But of course, he didn't speak Arabic. He actually was really disdainful of Arabs. He was from Kavala. He's an Albanian, was he? Albanian. Native language was Turkish. He would have called himself Mehmet Ali Pasha. So Mehmet Ali was himself an Ottoman through and through. But he was an ambitious man who came to Egypt in 1801 as part of an Anglo-Ottoman force to drive the Napoleonic army of France out of Egypt. They'd been occupying Egypt for three years, left behind a power vacuum, and Mehmed Ali was very clearly exploiting that power vacuum and the fact that he had an army under his control, Albanian detachment, to get into the politics of Egypt. And by 1804, he had succeeded where no predecessor had in getting the people of Cairo to petition Istanbul to make him the governor of Egypt. But in the 19th century, in the 18th and 19th century, Governors of Cairo lasted nine months, maybe a year. The first thing to say about Muhammad Ali that was so different is he's going to last 43. And in that time, he is going to turn Egypt into a family monopoly. He will establish his family's rule over Egypt, and that will last right up until the Egyptian Revolution of 1952. He concentrates all the agricultural and trade wealth of Egypt in his own treasury as a state. So he sets Egypt down the road of independent statehood. And as soon as he had entrenched himself in power, all that ambition began to spread. 
towards the Sudan, towards the Hejaz, towards Crete, towards Greece, and ultimately towards all of Bilad the Sham, greater Syria, taking on his Ottoman masters in a bid to create a new empire based in Egypt. From the Ottomans, where did it go wrong? It went wrong everywhere. Their man in Cairo had gone rogue, and they knew that the only way they were going to bring things back into order was to reform their own system. If anything, Muhammad Ali demonstrated how broken the Ottoman system was, how important it was that they engage in reform. So, in a sense, he plays as important a role in fostering reform in the Ottoman Empire as any European threat. Right, so then you've got, so you've got this period really over two centuries where there are local leaders becoming so powerful, they're going up against the Ottomans. Now, at the same time, the Europeans are obviously on the horizon as well. And Arabs and Ottomans are encountering Europeans for the first time. And they're realizing that actually, economically and militarily, these guys are, are way ahead of us. Now, the Ottomans, as you say, I think always maintained that they were morally and culturally superior to the Europeans. But they recognized that militarily and economically they were behind. So the Ottomans then turned to the banks and European banks, right? Mm -hmm. Just talk us through what, what happened there and what was the consequence of becoming really indebted. It's such an interesting crossroads because, as you rightly point out, Rihan, the Ottomans knew, as a matter of certainty, that their culture and civilization was superior. They never really thought that there was anything that the European powers had to teach them, except perhaps in military terms. But looking at Mehmed Ali in Egypt, the Ottomans recognized they needed to undertake administrative reform as well if they were to hold it all together. And in this administrative reform, European statecraft had things that was useful to them as well. Finally, the Ottomans recognized that they were weak against their own pashas like Mehmed Ali in Egypt. They actually needed European assistance to help them through this in domestic challenge of local leaders, and so they were very keen to preserve goodwill with the European powers. From Europe's perspective, the perception of Ottoman weakness created new opportunities and new dangers. Until 1800, you could say that the Europeans were quite nervous of the Ottoman Empire. Seeing Napoleon's conquest of Egypt made them realize how weak the Ottomans had become. But the Ottomans had been a threat right until 1800. After that, the perception of Ottoman weakness, the risk of an Ottoman collapse, the Europeans began to worry that this very strategic empire that straddled North Africa, Western Asia, Asia Minor, and Europe, were it to experience a collapse, the European powers would fight with each other over strategic territories they wanted for their own empires. If you like, the Europeans became more concerned about their own greed and ambitions. They talked about an Eastern question. And the Eastern question wasn't what to do about the sick man of Europe nearly so much as what to do about Europe's own ambition in the Eastern Mediterranean and in North Africa. And it was the British who came up with the solution, largely thanks to Muhammad Ali's occupation of Bilad al-Sham. When they drove the Egyptians out of Greater Syria in 1840, the Europeans came together and they devised a self-denying protocol, which said basically no one European power would seek any economic or territorial advantage in Ottoman domains that all the others didn't have too. Their big worry was that Russia or France or England not seize an advantage that would create trouble or wars in Europe. So really, there was a kind of symbiosis between Ottoman needs for reform and Europe's needs to see the Ottomans reform themselves mm. that was to really shape the middle decades of the 19th century, but where Europe was perhaps playing a slightly dishonest game at seizing opportunities to extend its control into North Africa and extend its influence in the Eastern Mediterranean, which was really going to be the extension of European rules over those territories. Okay, so um, I think the, uh, the subject about the banking, though, could you mention, talk a little bit about the banks? Because I think they were, Ottomans were indebted like $1.2 billion 
dollars in debt or something to the European banks? In current money terms. In current money terms, It yeah. was enormous. Uh, at the time, it was in the, in Egypt's case, the tens of millions of sterling. And I think it got to about 200 million sterling uh, in the Ottoman case. Right, right. But what Europe did in the middle decade of the 19th century was to establish a kind of colonial control over the Ottoman Empire in Egypt by economic means. It was much more cost effective to use these countries, to indebt these countries, uh, to use them as markets for your industrial goods. And then you could control them economically without having to go to the expense of formal empire. This informal empire was really the banker's empire over the Ottoman world, Tunisia, Egypt. But it all comes to an impasse when the pressures of bankruptcy force these local governments into crises, which will lead to outright colonial occupation. So Tunisia was the first. Uh, it's occupied then in 1881. And uh, Egypt was the second. Uh, declares its bankruptcy in the 1870s. It's occupied by Britain in 1882. The Ottoman Empire declares bankruptcy in 1875. It's never formally occupied, but it's forced to cede territories like Cyprus. It's forced to cede whole parts of its economy to European control. Tobacco, a European monopoly, both the buying of all tobacco and its exportation from Ottoman domains in European hands, salt, paper, fisheries, ports. The Europeans had the Ottoman Empire by the throat through bankruptcy. Who needed more formal empire than that? Okay, so one of the other things that seems to be happening is that the, uh, in order to um, take control back a little bit, the Ottomans start establishing a, a notion like Ottomanism, I think you, you call it, and it's kind of an Ottoman identity on the Arab world. But that actually is a little bit counterproductive. It unleashes Arab nationalism to some extent. C could you just talk us through that, what actually happens? Well, I think for all empires, nationalism is always the big threat. Whether it's a multi-ethnic, multinational empire like the Habsburg or the Ottoman, or whether it's the British or French empire, who in trying to control people in Asia and Africa, confronted the emergence of nationalism as the real threat to imperial control. So imperialism is the water that dissolves empire. There's another rule that we can say shapes modern history. For the Ottomans, they recognized, particularly in the Christian communities of the Balkans, that nationalism was a threat that they were losing ground to, starting with Greece in 1820, but working its way right through Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Nationalism was an established fact among the Christian majority territories of the Ottoman Empire and was leading to the fragmentation of Turkey and Europe. The Ottomans at one point, as part of their age of reform in the middle decades of the 19th century, thought the only way to fight nationalism was to establish identity politics of the Ottoman Empire. And they came up with this idea of Ottomanism. Ottomanism is very closely linked with the Ottoman reforms of the Tanzimat. And unfortunately, it was less successful than the reforms in engendering a strong sense of belonging or commitment. Ottoman Christians continued to develop much more of a kind of national identity around specific plots of land, Slavic peoples, their own history. In the Arab world, Ottomanism just didn't work because I think the barrier of language between Ottoman Turkish and Arabic meant that people felt much more tied to their Arabic language and culture than they ever did to an Ottoman language or culture. So in a sense, Ottomanism fails. We'll find that under Abdul Hamid, there's much more of an emphasis on Islam. And then under the Young Turks, increasingly a real notion of Turkish identity as what will hold the people of the Turkish Ottoman Empire together. In the Arab world, a whole range of new ideas are emerging about what is the politics of identity that best reflects the wishes of Arab peoples. Is it once again a great Arab empire as had been known by the Abbasids or the Umayyads? Is it going to be smaller based around Iraq or Syria or Hejaz? 
But these were debates that the Ottomans really sought to suppress. Public gatherings, political discussions were as unpopular in the 19th century Arab world as they are in the 21st century Arab world. And so talking dangerous political ideas was discouraged. But they still went on. They still developed in the 19th and early 20th century. It really was a period in which the Arab world began to follow quite a different identity politics. And I think that's where the First World War will prove another major crossroads. Okay, so I think you say that there are, there are two men who really shaped the ideas about Islam and modernity in the 19th century, Jamal al-Din al afghani and also Muhammad Abdu. Mm -hmm. So who were they and why were their ideas so popular? Well, I think al afghani was one of the most influential 19th century thinkers in the Islamic world. Though he took as a name al afghani it's widely reckoned he is Persian that though he spoke on behalf of so much of Sunni Islam at that time and mixed with Islamic thinkers from the Sunni world, it's widely assumed that his roots were in Shiism. In that sense, I suppose he was a man for all people. He moved from India to Egypt, to the Ottoman Empire, ultimately to Europe. He was never welcomed much longer than five or six years in any one country. Received as a great thinker, he always came to be perceived as a free thinker and troublemaker, but I think it was his time in Egypt, in El Azhar, in which he was really able to establish a school of thought that would be carried on by his colleague and student, Mohammed, Sheikh Mohammed Abdul, and following him, Rashid Rida from Syria, from Tripoli, in Lebanon, um, creating a school of Islamic reformism that was deemed Salafi in 19th century terms, which is to say, to try uh, not to pursue jihadist approaches to reform, but to purify Islam of irrational elements. This is an anti-Sufi movement. And to encourage a new rational thought and a new age of the interpretation of Islam, reopening ijtihad or interpretation of the Quran for modern times. And in that sense, it was an extremely exciting movement, very influential through publications such as El Urwa al Wutka, published in Paris between Lavrani and Mohammed Abdul. Texts that are still influential in Islamic thought today. I've got a copy on my shelf back in Oxford. And um, as I said, making in El Azhar a continuous chain of thinkers that will take Islam into a special place in the emergence of Arab nationalism as well that Islam is a fundamental part of Arab culture, and that there's no contradiction between Islamic values and national values, something that will be picked up by Egyptian nationalists such as Ahmed Lutfi Sayyid, himself very much trained in Al-Azhar, in the company of uh, Muhammad Abdul. So, yeah, I think the influence of these thinkers has, was enormous in their own time and has been enduring down to the present day. Okay. So I think one figure that really strikes me, uh, captures my romantic spirit a little bit from, of the period in the 1970s is Abdul Qadir in Algeria. So just shifting it a little bit to the mm. more west. And of course the French occupy uh, Algeria. Abdul Qadir comes from a Sufi background, but yet he leads this, he's almost like this Saladin or Salahuddin figure. Um, and the French have great admiration for him as well. Now, can you just talk us through who was he and how did he sort of, you know, come to this great reputation amongst the French? as this kind of noble Arab warrior, although they were fighting against him? No, it's true. I think that the French had great respect for the, the noble foe that they managed to defeat. I mean, I think the respect for Abdel Qadir in France probably grew after they beat him, as long as he was standing up and provoking the resistance to the French army of invasion in Algeria after 1830. He was the outlaw and the rebel that they sought to suppress, and it took them over 10 years to do so. He took advantage of that natural unwillingness of people to be ruled by foreigners, the pride of Algerian Muslims in seeing their culture and civilization as superior to that of their invaders, the willingness of people to take risks and mobilize against such a strong enemy as the French who were willing to put large armies with modern cannons and technology into the field against them. And they drew the French into a kind of guerrilla warfare for which 
regular armies were less well suited and were able to secure major victories against the French. But ultimately, the French faced a decision after their initial occupation of Algiers, whether they were going to claim this territory and colonize it, or whether they would deem their occupation a victory and withdraw. They took the fateful decision of extending their control over the Matija Plain and inland. They wanted to control Constantine, as well as Algiers, and ultimately in Western Algeria, Oran. And so this creates a, a war of conquest in which um, Abdel Qadr was able to mobilize the very strong Sufi orders and their lodges in the countryside as a basis of mobilization to sustain a long-term occupation. He ultimately, he was driven into refuge in uh, northeastern Morocco, where the French finally cornered him, secured his surrender with the consent of the Moroccan authorities, was imprisoned in France, and um, only after 1848 was allowed to have his freedom to go into exile in the Ottoman Empire. He, he chose Damascus and establishes himself there, returning to his Sufi intellectual pursuits. He spends his last days more involved in mysticism than in resistance. But he'll figure in my next book as one of my eyewitnesses to the massacres in Damascus in 1860. Uh, Abdel Qadr emerges as a hero figure once again, as one yeah. who was protecting the Christians of Damascus, for which he would receive medals by the French government. Mm -hmm. President Lincoln of the United States sent him a brace of pistols as a way of congratulating him for his honors. And he would be remembered in, um, in, in Damascus as an ayin or one of the notables of Damascus. Mm -hmm. His family, the Jazairi family, is a notable family of Damascus down to the present day. Yeah. But ironically, under French maintenance, mm -hmm. they paid him a salary in Damascus until his dying day and his family thereafter. So resistance, agent, mystic, warrior, a man full of contradictions. The life of Abdel Qadir al-Jazairi is one of great rich and developed interest, it would be... Worth writing a fiction on it. Worth writing a fiction on Okay, let's discuss that later on. So then I think um, by the time the First World War starts, so this has come forward a little bit, by the time the First World War starts, uh, the French have taken Tunisia, Britain has taken Egypt, Italy has taken Cyrenesia or Libya by that mm -hmm. time. Ottoman power is eroding. How is that being perceived from you know, the Arab world? Is that being seen as an opportunity uh, for nationalism to emerge? What's the sentiment? The sentiment on the outbreak of World War I in the Arab world was quite mixed. On the one hand, if you viewed the outbreak of the First World War from the Arab provinces, you knew that this was a fight between the European powers. It didn't involve the Middle East, didn't involve the Arabs, didn't involve the Turks. If Austrians and Serbs want to kill each other or kill each other's archdukes, let them do it. The idea that the Ottoman Young Turk regime would draw the empire into this war in which the Arabs had no fight provoked a tremendous sense of fear and gloom and despair. So on the one hand, it's a very unpopular war from the beginning. Secondly, and the, the Arabs were immediately recruited into the Ottoman army. Now, this wasn't the first time the Arabs had been drafted into the Ottoman army. Most young men had only just come home from the Balkan Wars. These are two wars where the Ottomans fought against the new Balkan states that had been former Ottoman provinces. They fought against Greece and Bulgaria and Montenegro, Serbia, Romania, and they were thrashed. And the Arabs had fought in these wars and seen it firsthand how ill-prepared the Ottomans were, how bad military discipline was. The idea of going to faraway lands that you don't feel are your own to defend them and die for them was very unpopular with the Arabs. So going into the draft again had the Arabs extremely upset. And in many diaries from the time, it's the first thing they write when they hear about Safad Verlik, the Ottoman recruitment, conscription, was despair. But they didn't dare avoid recruitment, conscription, because you face a de death penalty. So they joined the Ottoman army to go and fight in distant lands very reluctantly. 
And at this time, many in the Arab world believed that the Ottoman Empire had taken on enemies too strong. In the First World War, they sided with Germany, a great power, against Britain and France and Russia, which were deemed to be the greatest powers. Russia had fought the Ottomans in 1699, I think 12 times, and beat them every time. So who had any confidence that the Ottomans, now at war with Russia and with Britain and with France, would win this war? So maybe there's an opportunity here, an identity politics of an Arab variety began to take root. And so this is where you had the beginning of Arabism, the discussion between secret societies like Jamaat al-Fatat al-Suriya, the, the young Syrian society, or Al-Ahad, which was a military society among officers mostly from Iraq, reaching out to the Sharif of Mecca, al Hussein bin Ali, to see whether they couldn't create a movement against the Ottomans and establishing an Arab state. So, there were those politics as well. But ultimately, the Ottomans had ruled the Arab world by the time of World War I, since 1516, 400 years. It was beyond the political imagination of most Arabs to imagine a world without the Ottomans. The only equivalent in my life was how difficult it was to imagine the reunification of Germany after the Cold War. I, I was so ingrained with East Germany and West Germany and a very hard border between them. I could never imagine a time where the two Germanys would unite. And that had only been a separation of 40 years. So imagine for Arabs after 400 years of Ottoman rule, how difficult it was to imagine getting rid of the Turks. So most Arabs did not subscribe to national politics, didn't want to be in the war, they just wanted to keep their heads down and sit on the fence. And surprisingly, through most of the war, the attitude was skepticism about the Hashemites and the Arab revolt, fear of Ottoman repression, and really no confidence that Britain was going to win the war after all because they watched them lose to the Turks in Gallipoli, they watched them lose to the Turks in Kota Lamara, they watched them bleed to death in the trenches of the Western Front. Who was to say that the Ottomans and their German ally wouldn't, at the end of the day, win the war. Better be on the Turks' good side if that was the case. Now, of course, the Turks didn't want to enter the First World War. They were rather kind of maneuvered into it by the Germans, right? Because uh, they were like, you're all cousins, you're all fighting, don't involve us, it's a family feud. Uh, but anyway, they got involved in the First World War. Uh, what was then the role of the colonial powers in stirring trouble in Ottoman lands against the Ottomans. I mean, you, you briefly mentioned the, the Arab revolt. What, what else was going on, and what were the, some of the agreements made at the time? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is Britain and France underestimated their Ottoman adversary. Again, I don't blame them. I just talked about the Balkan Wars and how badly the Ottomans did in the Balkan Wars. Germany had been helping the Ottomans rebuild their army. But Britain had helped with a naval mission to the Ottoman Empire to help rebuild the Ottoman fleet. They knew the weaknesses of the Ottoman Empire from within. But they underestimated how strong people would be in defending their own territory. And the Ottomans were very dogged in their defense. So, as I said, they, they, they succeeded in hanging on to the Straits of the Dardanelles against the combined forces of the British and French for 10 months and were victorious. This is very good for Ottoman sort of esprit de corps. Similarly, in Mesopotamia, after a string of victories where an Anglo-Indian army took Basra, took Amara, took Kut, and kept marching towards Baghdad, they were held by the Ottomans in uh, the Battle of uh, Ketesiphon, or Salman Pak, and then forced into retreat, held under siege for four months before they surrendered in 1916 to the Ottomans. At that point, the British didn't want to put any more troops into the Middle Eastern arena. They knew that the war was going to be won on the Western Front, and they didn't want to divert soldiers away from the French and British frontiers, I'm sorry, French and Belgian frontiers, to fight in the Ottoman Empire. At that point, they wanted to try and use local allies 
to overturn the Ottomans. And that's where the Sharifs of Mecca and the idea of an Arab revolt was so seductive for the British. In a sense, they hoped to create a kind of jihad of Arabs against Ottomans, giving the banner of Islam to the leading religious official of the Arab world, the Sharif of Mecca, in this way invalidating the Ottoman Sultan's claim to be not just Sultan, but Khalifa, and to create a mass movement that would undermine the Ottomans from within. And of course, that never happens either. I mean, in essence, the Arab revolt is a fight in the Hejaz until the very closing months of the war. And it's a fight in which very few people in the Arab world responded positively. There wasn't the sort of mass Arab uprising in Damascus, in Lebanon, in Aleppo, in Mosul, in Baghdad, as I think people of Al Fatat and Al Ahid had hoped they could provoke. The fence sitting tradition was very strong in the First World War, and most Arabs did not declare themselves in favor of Arab politics. So even these British hopes to try and create trouble within the Ottoman Empire didn't work. In the end, they had to go back to diverting troops to Egypt to try and make a campaign of conquest through the Sinai, through Palestine, and then ultimately Transjordan and Damascus in partnership with the Hashemite forces of the Arab Revolt. But it meant that they were dragged into the Ottoman front for the full four years of the war. The Ottoman Empire, by the way, only accepts defeat 11 days before Germany. So they looked as though they were going to be the weakest link in the Central Powers chain, but the dogged Turk fought a damn good war and saw it through until the very closing days of October And 19 they renegotiated their peace treaty, right? Well, that they get to do by 1923, yeah. when having defeated everyone who wanted to partition Ottoman Anatolia, Turkey, was able to come out victorious after the Turkish War of Independence, beating the Greeks, the Armenians, the French, the Italians, and the British, to go back to the victorious powers, dictate their own terms in a new treaty of Lausanne in 1923, recognizing the Tur Turkish Republic as we know it now. Okay. So the Ottomans, obviously, they're on the losing side in the First World War. Um, after the First World War finishes, between the two wars, then there's a lot of uh, horse trading, if you like, going on between colonial powers making promises to uh, Arab uh, communities, making promises to, to Zionist communities, and so on. So just, just talk us through that period between the two wars, and maybe Israel-Palestine, kind of, or Lebanon, or whichever, whichever you know, yeah, what's going on. We're not avoiding mention of the dread word Sykes-Picot, Hussein McMahon, Balfour Declaration. Okay, a show of hands. Does anybody in the room need me to tell you what Sykes-Picot is? I didn't think so. I think I come to Abu Dhabi, I can count on you guys knowing what's going on. In, in the fall of the Ottomans, this partition diplomacy plays a really big part of my story. What I try and say in this is, we do still misunderstand what happened in terms of the diplomacy between Britain, France, and Russia to carve up the Asian provinces of the Ottoman world. See it not as Sykes-Picot, because Sykes-Picot was just one plan. See it as a work in progress. It actually begins in uh, the Constantinople Agreement of March 1915. And a show of hands, has anybody heard of the Constantinople Agreement of March 1915? Oh, okay, I have one thing I can tell you about you don't know. <laughs> it's the first partition, and it's Russia that starts it. And Russia turns to its British and French allies just before they begin the campaign in Gallipoli, which was a campaign not just to seize Gallipoli, but to go through the streets and take the Ottoman capital and beat the Turks in the opening days of the war. That was the game plan on Gallipoli. It, it didn't go that way. And Russia is really terrified that if Britain and France get to Istanbul first, that they may claim control over not Istanbul, but Constantinople, Byzantium, the seat of Eastern Orthodoxy. Russia wanted Constantinople for itself. So it comes to its allies and says, when we beat the Turks, we get the European shores of the waters between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara, and the Dardanelles, and we get Constantinople. The British and French said, okay, we're going to give you what we recognize as the greatest prize of the whole war. 
but we have to get something in return. And by the way, this is not a fiction. This is really the way they saw it. So the French said, right, we want Syria and Cilicia. Anybody know where Cilicia is? Okay, it's around Adana. These are Roman toponyms. These are Roman place names. They, they didn't mean a lot to me too. I had to look up Cilicia to find out exactly what we meant when we talked about Cilicia. Syria, I had an idea. But there was no Ottoman province called Syria. No clear boundary on what Syria was or Cilicia was. Wallahimmak. Britain and Russia promised France, Cilicia and Syria. Now, here's the one you won't expect, one secret of the Arab world. When it was Britain's turn, they said, okay, we don't actually know what we want. Britain enters the First World War with no territorial ambition in the Ottoman Empire. They said, we just want to reserve the right to claim territory that's going to be just as strategic when we decide what's going to be of interest to us. And they convened a committee called the De Bunsen Committee in 1915 to consider the question, what would be in the interest of the British Empire? I, I, I don't spoil the story for you if I tell you they settle on Mesopotamia or Iraq. That's ultimately what they'll take. But it's just interesting to know that Britain enters this with no territorial ambition in the Ottoman Empire. It, you take Constantinople Agreement, March 1915 is your starting point. Everything else makes sense. So Hussein McMahon is next. That's just to try and conclude a deal to get the Hashemites to make a revolt, to weaken the Ottomans from within, as we just described. Okay, now they promised the Hashemites an Arab kingdom in basically all of the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East, not including Egypt, but right up to the frontiers of Turkey, with certain exceptions, because they're thinking we don't want to promise them land we've already promised the French. As soon as they've concluded this agreement, very vague, as you'll remember, Hussein's letter to Sharif, I'm sorry, McMahon's letter to Sharif Hussein of 24 October 1915, on the districts to the west of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo. Now they've got to go back to the French and say to them, okay, guys, we promised you Cilicia and Syria, but honestly, we're not sure what the geography of that is. So could we agree what the territory is you're claiming? That's sykes Pico. It's just the middle of this whole process. Then they want to bring in other allies, Greece, Italy. You have the agreement of Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, another obscure agreement that will have no effect on the map. But they're promising everyone on their aunt a little piece of Ottoman land to get them sweet on the Ottoman, I mean, the, the First World War effort. And then they decide they need the Zionist movement. Why? Because they were all anti-Semites. The British government were full of people who were anti-Semitic. But they believed that Zionism represented a global Jewish power in finance and politics, that it would be particularly influential in Russia, which has had a revolution and is under an interim government led by Kerensky. They believed Kerensky was surrounded by influential Jewish financiers who might keep Russia in the war. And they believed Woodrow Wilson over in Washington, D.C. was also surrounded by powerful Jewish advisors. And they were desperately afraid that Zionism would side with Germany. You think of Germany as the Third Reich, but remember, Germany was the place of the Jewish Enlightenment. It was as logical that Zionism would have sided with Germany in the First World War as with Britain. But Chaim Weizmann was based in Britain. He had access to British politicians through his war contributions. And he leveraged that connection to the Max in securing support for the idea of Britain giving Zionism its support, not for a Jewish state and not in the name of Zionism, but a watered-down promise to give Britain's best influence to create a Jewish national home. What was in it for Britain? At the time that they made the Balfour Declaration, Britain had just broken through in the Third Battle of Gaza and was now marching through Palestine. Um, They'd recognized the strategic importance of Palestine for Britain's control of the Suez Canal because when the Ottomans controlled Palestine, they made two attacks on the Suez Canal in World War I. With long-range artillery, you could not secure the Suez Canal unless you had the water resources of southern Palestine because all of the Sinai is dry and you can't station troops where there's no water. If you control Palestine, you can secure the Suez Canal. 
They learned that lesson in World War I. Though they entered the war with no territorial ambitions, by God did the British leave the war with territorial ambitions. <laughs> they wanted Palestine, but in Sykes-Picot it was international. What better way to secure Palestine from your French allies with make it, without making them really angry than by doing so in the name of a great cause? The historic restoration of the Jewish people to their biblical homeland was it. Okay. So there we have in one quick sweep <laughs> a process through which all these agreements fit together to make a picture in which each of them makes sense. But my last comment, yep. none of these agreements was possible in peacetime. They're all crazy agreements. No rational government would have made any of them. Constantinople, Sykes-Picot, Hussein McMahon, or the Balfour Declaration. It was only conceivable in the context of the First World War. Britain didn't side with the Arabs, so no betrayal there. They weren't in it for Sharif Hussein. They certainly didn't side with the Zionists. They were only in it for the British Empire and to win the First World War. And if you understand that about the British war effort, then you can respond to many of the myths that have emerged about all of this wartime diplomacy that have emerged ever since. Very good. Okay, we've just got under 10 minutes left. I'm going to open it up for questions. And obviously what we've just done now is that we've cantered through from around the 16th century all the way up to the Second World War, the relationship between the Arabs and the Ottomans. So now, uh, there are questions. Yep, please. Um, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, history lesson. You've cantered us through just an amazing part um, of, of world history in such an engaging way. Where did T.E. Lawrence and Gertrude Bell, who were called to Cairo to advise, I understand, um, the uh, powers that be, on how the lines, the tribal lines met? Where did they fit in, or is that a myth as well? As far as I know, Lawrence and Bell weren't actually involved in the distribution of territory until the Cairo Conference in 1921. And this is where they're convened by Churchill as colonial secretary to address the problem of how to rule the territories that Britain and its allies had just agreed to distribute at San Remo. And so, and, and were now accorded to Britain by the League of Nations and to France by the League of Nations. So they were looking at basically Iraq and Palestine. And Palestine at that point still included Transjordan. And they were trying to come up with ideas on governance to make the least draw on the British treasury. And that would cause the least resistance by the local population. And so it, where Bell and Lawrence were most influential was encountering arguments that wanted to bring direct forms of colonial rule on the Indian model, but rather to try and work with local political leaderships to have, if you like, local agents rule these countries on their behalf. And their, their role in working with the Hashemites in the Arab Revolt meant that the Hashemites were the natural partners for Britain's rule in Iraq and Palestine. And the idea was to try and create Arab kingdoms in Hejaz under King Hussein of the Hejaz, formerly Sharif Hussein of Mecca, now King Hussein of Hejaz. Uh, originally, they thought of putting his son Abdullah on the throne in Iraq, and Faisal was to be on the throne in Damascus. But he's turfed out of Damascus by the French, and so he becomes the king of choice for Iraq. And Abdullah, who has just shown up in Amman in a bid to reclaim Damascus for his family's rule, very inconvenient for the British trying to keep peace with the French, he becomes a solution as a ruler in lands to the east of the Jordan, which will, in 1922, be separated off from the Palestine. I think Bell and Lawrence were at their most influential in putting the Hashemite can, uh, case forward, as serving as Britain's partners and ruling the new mandates on their behalf. Okay, any other questions? Yep, the lady just here. That was so interesting, thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to ask you, since you have this much real information about our history. Now, as you know that the Treaty uh, of Severia was signed in 1920. Mm -hmm. And next year it will mark the 100 years of this treaty and it will actually be ended. Seeing history, how do you really project the future of this region? How do you see it? Well, a lot has happened in the past hundred years. 
And many people have predicted the end of the state system that was left behind by European imperial rule. A lot of people look to the Daesh movement as an effort that would erase boundaries, that maybe there was a greater appeal of an Islamic ummah or a caliphal state. Now, obviously, Daesh and its vision was strongly opposed by the West. But it was ultimately destroyed by people in the region itself who felt most threatened to the states that they live within and are committed to. I, I think that in the past hundred years that Iraq and Syria and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait have emerged as sovereign realities that are very unwilling to dissolve their borders into some new vision. No more an Islamic vision than an Arab national vision of the days of Abdel Nasser or of the Arab Ba'ath Party. So I think the state system will survive looking to the future. It's been tested. In many places, it's broken. I think it's going to be very difficult to reestablish in Iraq or in Syria the same level of national cohesion as those countries knew before the wars that have so destroyed their territories. But maybe there's a new age of federalism coming in which the way you hold these countries together nominally is by giving more autonomy to regions on regional or ethnic or sectarian lines. Clearly, the social contract between governments in these states and their people is being challenged, not just in 2011, but what's happening now in Sudan, what's happening now in Algeria. So I think that there are changes yet to come to states in the region. And I think that there is a will on the part of the people to change governments that rule through fear to governments that will be held accountable. Um, I think the region has more resources than ever. It has a youthful population that is better educated than ever. It has a geostrategic place that will always keep it in the center of the world. But it has deep problems of its own making and made by foreign powers through the will to dominate or through bad will or whatever. But ultimately, no one's going to come to the rescue of the region. The region will have to find its own solutions. And I have confidence because I know how much intelligence and talent there is to be had in this region. If it's diverted to good ends, the sky is the limit. Okay, uh, just uh, let me just go to the back. Let's go to the back. And yeah, we got to get this gentleman to the front row then too. We'll get, we'll get yeah. you yet. Yeah, we'll come to you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I just wanted to ask a personal question because at the beginning, I mean, you, you said you teach at Oxford. Your accent is not very British, I might be mistaken. Made in America. Made in America, okay. So what brings, I don't know where in America, but what brings uh, somebody from America to an interest in the Arab world? How did you fall into uh, studying the Arabs? You obviously have a very deep understanding. Uh, if you could just give us, uh, I mean, how you, and who influenced you into that? I don't want to age you, but where did you study it? And who, who uh, directed you? That's such a bad question because you can get such a long answer from me. I could sit here and give you my whole life story. You've got one minute. <laughs> <'Cause I'm laughs> <gonna> go. <laughs> but I'll keep it brief, the CV. And my introduction to the region was thanks to my father and his work, uh, we left my native America when I was six years old. I grew up in Europe and got to the Middle East when I was 10. And we moved to Beirut in 1971. And I lived five years in Beirut and after the Civil War reached a point of no return, we, we moved at the end of 1975 to Cairo. And I lived three years in Cairo where I finished high school. My game plan had been to do like everyone I saw around me, go get a good economics degree, go to business school, come back to the Arab world and get rich. Okay? Somewhere along the line, I took a degree in Middle Eastern studies, started reading history, and somewhere I took a very bad turn where instead of pursuing a lucrative career in business, <laughs> I studied history. I went back to Jordan, uh, studied at the University of Jordan to work on my Arabic and to do my doctoral research. And everyone kept asking me, sort of, I was at Harvard, it's a good university, I'm an American, I have great prospects. <laughs> Tells you a lot about how people see history in the Arab world. You know, a clever boy shouldn't be studying history. So I think a lot of people thought I must have been for the CIA or a spy or something. 
But the truth of the matter is, you can have a good living in history. My job security working on the history of the Middle East has never been better because this region generates history at an industrial scale. And getting the job in Oxford, which I got 28 years ago, was the luckiest break in my life because I'm part of an amazing intellectual community, first created by Albert Hurani, who is my mentor figure. If I could aspire to be like anyone, I would like to be a historian like Albert Hurani. And we have the best Middle East studies community I've ever seen anywhere. And we get wonderful students, great resources. And London is so close. We're, you know, th two hours from Morocco and six hours from Abu Dhabi. So it's given me an opportunity. Now, what is it, 40 years to live in, to study or to teach the Arab world. I think I landed better than pursuing the business career, you know? It's we, okay. We would agree. Okay, last question just very quickly here then. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for this constant lecture about our history because I'm Syrian. I saw why. Uh, so My next book's on Damascus. Yeah, <laughs> so interactive. So uh, let, let, let me go back to the European Enlightenment. Uh, it was British, as Springer said, mm -hmm. and uh, the glorious is for John Locke. So we can go uh, ahead for, to our <coughs> own history. That's we, can we compare between the uh, or European Enlightenment and the Arab Enlightenment? Mm -hmm. And so uh, there, there is some Enlightenment people like al Fagani and Hamad Abdo and the other Jazairi, you said paid by France or something like that. Uh, like that. So my question is, um, did we know uh, the enlightenment, the real enlightenment in, in our Arab world? So in Europe, the enlightenment produced the tolerance. Mm -hmm. Tolerance produced the new or the modern state. Mm -hmm. What is? What are the barriers behind uh, ahead us to build our modern state that we didn't never? No, in our own history. 19, uh, 1916, I don't like this. Thing. No, I don't blame you. <coughs> I don't blame okay. you. We have to keep this one a bit quick. because. All I right, I'll keep this one brief because we're going to have to end the session. We're coming to the end now. <clears throat> the one big difference I would say between the Enlightenment and the Arab Nahda is that the Enlightened finished and the Nahda goes on. And in this edition of the Arabs, I begin with Samir Qasir who talks about the meaning of the Nahda in the 20th century. It didn't end in the 19th century. And it, it doesn't end just in the area of political and social and Islamic thought, but it continues in cinema and in the development of the Arabic novel and in the creativity that the Arabs have shown in so many domains that is in dialogue with the culture and the developments of the modern world as a global phenomenon, not just Europe. Arabs today take their inspiration from China, from India, from Brazil, not just from Europe. It's a global phenomenon. It's very exciting. And it goes on. There is something to be gained by the fact that Arabs are not satisfied, that they have not realized their ambition. So it means that there is still fire in the belly to move forward and do better. You have so many problems. I don't wish to sound like I sweep this under the carpet. You're Syrian. I don't have to tell you. But the future can be absolutely amazing when the global Arab and all of the cultural strength and intellectual strength that this people that has come to succeed in every country where they've gone to study and bring it back home, let that loose, take away the restraints on society. The Nahda is yet to be fulfilled and I think it's going to bring great things. Inshallah. Okay, inshallah. All right. So I think we've had a very entertaining history lesson of like 400 years condensed <laughs> into one hour. I'd like to thank you very much for coming and thank also all the room staff for helping out. But most of all, let's give Dr. Eugene oh, Rogan a huge round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Rihan. No, no, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Great, great. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Eugene uh, Rohan will be send, uh, signing books at the back of the hall because we have another event to come in quickly and something's overrunning here. If you wish to purchase Eugene's book, can I suggest you purchase it from the bookstore here and then move to the back of the venue here so that he can sign it and then we can get, we can get the, next, um, the, the next event here on the stage.